And today we are beginning our new study on our direction. And one of the most important things in any group situation is how do we get everybody going the same way at the same time at the same pace it's one of the incredible difficulties of any sort of pastoral situation is you have folks who are as and really that's why uh, while both military imagery and family imagery is used in the uh, in in the bible to describe our uh, the way that we coordinate as a church actually both are very important to us uh, understanding that in a, a good military unit, as in a good family, that, that we understand each other's weaknesses, strengths, shortcomings, where we're at, and um, how that is going to be utilized, how we can foster growth and recognize that we are working together. And it's just uh, not, uh, not easy to, to, to coordinate as a group. It's easy for us as we're in a body, as we're in a church to see, well, to say things like, well, my needs aren't exactly where this church is, what this church is providing. That's why it's so important at that point to step, stand up and say, I think I see something we need to do or something we need to not do uh, that's going on. Uh, but ultimately, <clears throat> Our goal this year is as we do, our, we usually have a one-off uh, sermon to talk about our direction for the year and uh, maybe some consideration of what we've done in the past year. But we are this year going to be doing a, ser a series on four uh, or five, actually, five, yeah, five different messages on some basic distinctives of Fort Collins Bible Church and how we need to and how we're meant to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, be on the same direction, be on the same course together. And it's really interesting because it's something that the church has struggled with and, and, and wrestled with and tussled with for years. How do we get uh, direction and how do we unify and what do we unify around you see we have all of these uh, really rather simplistic nice hallmark card kinds of answers right that seem to do until you actually scrutinize them like you know what we're just gathered around Jesus well who's Jesus because there are plenty of counterfeit Jesuses available, plenty of different interpretations. There's the Jesus who, who isn't God, but he's a great teacher. There's the Jesus who didn't really live, but he's a great spiritual moral symbol or figure. There's the Jesus who did live, and on and on and on. So if we just say we gather around Jesus, that's really not a sufficient statement because every New Age goofball and, and author and every person uh, of any other religion or cult has dealt with Jesus. Mormon Jesus and Bible Jesus are two different Jesuses. Jehovah's Witness Jesus and Bible Jesus are two irreconcilably different Jesuses, right? So um, the other simple one that we'll say is, oh, well, we gather around just simply the Word of God. If the Word of God says it, that's what we're gathered around. But that's problematic because I don't know if you've noticed, there's a lot of information here. It takes some working through. It takes some doing. So the church, in order to, over the years, in, in our 2,000-year history as the body of Christ on earth, uh, the church made up of Jews and Gentiles, and come up with various ways of trying to deal with this situation. So one of them, ancient, one ancient institution has been the creeds. And so there were creeds written up to say, we believe the word of God, we believe in Jesus, but if there's gonna be some sort of one-off, simple thing that we could all learn and stack hands on and say, this is what it means to be a Christian. Now the creeds weren't uh, perfect by any means, we could nitpick them, but here is an example of probably one of the earliest and most important creeds in church history called the Apostles' Creed. Uh, this predates the Nicene Creed, which is very similar. If you're from a high church background, you probably memorized this or some variation of this. And it goes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and he ascended into heaven. He sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So this is, when you look at it, it's a pretty good statement, I would say. We would take issue with certain things about descending into hell, because it's not the way that we use hell. That's why I've literally Hades written there. 
um, which is the place of the dead, or the Greek word for the place of the dead. There might be other points at which we would uh, take issue or nitpick, but that was how they did it. Can you agree to all these things? Fine, you're a Christian. We might uh, note that there's a suspicious lack of substitution. It doesn't say anything about Jesus Christ dying for sins. It doesn't say anything about putting faith in him for salvation per se. It's just an affirmation of certain doctrines and ideas. So in that regard, we'd probably say it's kind of a miss. Well, anyway, other, uh, the other uh, creeds came up over time. But the point that I want to bring out here is not to criticize creeds or evaluate creeds. It's a wonderful study that we won't do from the pulpit. Uh, but I want to note that the point of the creeds was trying to get everybody on the same page. What, what are these essentials we can bring uh, people around? The next uh, thing that we'll talk about today is we had the, the age of catechism, catechisms and confessions. And so particularly after the Reformation, the, picture, the idea of catechisms and confessions became important because the Catholic Church had their catechism. And a catechism is just a teaching tool. And essentially the way that they would teach people and, and catechize or basically build them up into their entry into the church was a series of questions and rote memorized answers. And the idea was that if you could repeat back all these answers in good faith, then you could be a part of the church, or at least that was, again, part of the requirements for the Catholic Church as it became increasingly uh, worldly in its way. But it was a way to try to make sure that everybody who got in believed the same thing. And moving on to confessional churches like uh, the Episcopal Church and others, they would, they'll even go so far as to say it doesn't matter, not all across the board, but many uh, of the uh, priests and can, pra, pastors and can, practitioners thereof will say it doesn't matter if you believe it or not. They'll say we're a confessional tradition. It only matters whether you get together and say the same things as us. It's a really fascinating, uh, almost postmodern view of, of spirituality that is really not about what's true. It's about us doing this thing together, um, which is, again, uh, I would say a flawed notion. But what are they trying to do? Get everybody on the same page at the same time. It's actually a recognition of something very real, which is I cannot control, right? And no leader can control what you're going to think, not perfectly. We can affirm that you all sit here and listen for the time that we're here, but that's not the same as knowing that you agreed with everything that was said. Quite frankly, it would be um, odd if you did, right? And that'd be just a brainwashing. Um, so anyway, but this is still a, a church, the church's goal of trying to get people in the same foot, same direction. Uh, the next thing that we see showing up in, in church history, or one of the next things, is uh, what we'll call the doctrinal statement. And this is what we have one in the back. I think it's a very good thing. It's a basically a, a short or shortish. Some doctrinal statements can be quite long, pages and pages. But my view of the value of a doctrinal statement is to get some of the things that we find most important as a body, as a, as a group, as a, as a local expression of the body of Christ. Finding things that we find to be priority and understand, not that you have to agree with all the doctrinal statement, you understand what this church teaches. And hopefully you're growing towards either agreeing with the doctrinal statement or you are, we're growing towards changing it to make it more correct or accurate biblically. With the recognition that the do doctrinal statement's not divinely inspired, but the Word of God is. So it's a way to have a sort of living document that can be uh, shaped and continually molded in reaction to how we understand and teach the Word of God. And Again, I just wanted to, because this is such an important tool in keeping us going the same way at the same time, I wanted to go through our doctrinal statement. It's less than a page. First of all, our first and primary affirmation in the doctrinal statement is about the scriptures. That we believe all 66 books of scripture are God-breathed, authoritative, and without error in the original manuscripts. We believe in literal, normal interpretation of the Bible in light of the historical context and proper grammar. Second, we affirm the Trinity. We believe in one God who has revealed himself as three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, each distinct from the other but equal in attributes and essence. Three, Satan and demons. We believe that Satan is an angel in rebellion against God. And demons are angels who have followed in him, him in his rebellion. We believe Satan and his demons are active in the world today. 
4. Man created and fallen. We believe that man was created by God as a human being and did not evolve from a lower order of life. We believe that man was created in the image of God and that he fell through disobedience and, as a consequence of his disobedience, gained an inner desire for sin. We believe all people are born into this world as sinners and are, apart from salvation in Christ, lost and hopelessly doomed to eternal destruction as a consequence. Five, the first advent. We believe that God, the Son, Jesus Christ, was conceived supernaturally by the Holy Spirit and born naturally to Mary. We believe he lived a sinless life and died for sin on the cross. Six, salvation only through Christ. We believe that salvation from sin comes by the grace of God alone, through personal faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, as the one who paid the penalty for sin on the cross. We believe salvation from sin can never be earned by good works. Seven, eternal security. We believe that those who are saved from sin on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ alone are rescued forever from the penalty of sin and cannot enter into condemnation. Eight, the Holy Spirit. We believe that the Holy Spirit baptizes, dwells, and seals anyone who trusts Christ alone for his or her salvation and then continues to work in the life of the believer, leading him or her toward transformation into the image of Christ. We believe the Holy Spirit imparts spiritual gifts to each believer for the edification of the body of Christ. Nine, the ordinances of the church. Baptism. We believe baptism is the immersion of a believer in water and is properly called believer's baptism. We believe believer's baptism serves as a picture of our death to sin and our own resurrection into a new life in Christ. We believe baptism in no way contributes to or offers salvation from sin. B, the Lord's Supper. We believe the Lord's Supper is the particular means Christ ordained for the assembly of believers to remember his death and to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. By means of the symbols of the bread and the fruit of the vine, we believe the Lord's Supper in no way contributes to or offers salvation from or forgiveness of sin. Finally, 10, the end times. We believe that according to the word of God, the next great event in the fulfillment of prophecy shall be coming of the Lord in the air to receive himself his church, receive to himself his church. We believe that Jesus Christ shall return in power and glory to judge the nations of the earth and to set up his millennial kingdom. We believe in the bodily resurrection of believers to eternal life and the bodily resurrection of unbelievers to eternal punishment. I know you didn't expect a, a, a prolonged reading, but to be honest, we don't do it enough. We teach verse by verse, and that's a wonderful thing, but it's helpful to step back and say, these are all things that we can stack hands on. These are things that we can agree upon, the nature of God and salvation. So this is what the purpose or the function of a doctrinal statement has been, is to say, yeah, please come and grow. You don't have to agree with all of this per se to, um, to take part meaningfully in the church, but recognize that this is what we're about. This is what it means to be about, a part of Fort Collins Bible Church is some of these core beliefs or things that we would probably call non-negotiables in terms of uh, moving towards ministry. And what we've distilled as being primarily important and uh, directionally important from the Word of God. So, after that, we have a comp constitution and bylaws. I won't read all those to you. But um, the constitution and bylaws just talk about everything from uh, how we deal with church discipline, what church membership means to us, and how we are uh, governed by um, a board of elders and a board of deacons, how we are how we do business, how we operate, how people maintain their positions and uh, might choose to uh, might lose them or choose to forfeit them. All that business is more laid out, you might say, in our constitution and bylaws. That's kind of a more of a nuts and bolts, particularly important legally because should we ever choose to dissolve all the finances or uh, uh, holdings of the church or whatever else, would it's a designated where they'll go. So there's no opportunity, at least theoretically, for anyone to abscond with anything. So very, very important, more of a on the legal side document, uh, but does give us some value in, in, in how understanding in writing how we're going to tend to head and, and how we're going to operate. And finally, the mission statement. And this is what we really haven't had at our church. We've sort of maintained the idea. We have our, 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 our church 
Bible verse, if you like, Colossians 1, 27, 28, and, and that's good, and that's wonderful for direction, but we've never taken the time in my 10 years here to just sit down and, and lay out a picture of where we want to go if, in one simple statement. And of course, this simple statement is going to be general and it's rather generic, but hopefully gives us a picture of where we want to head as a church body and gives us some direction that you can put in front of you and say, what does it mean to be a part of Fort Collins Bible Church? Well, Here's a starting place. So, uh, Matt Fern and Sam Kasich and I have been meeting each week for, goodness, it's, it's have to be at least six months now, maybe more, six or eight months. Uh, we've been meeting now and uh, each week, and one of the things we've been doing is crafting this statement. So, I'm going to read it to you now, and at the end, as we evaluate it and brief today, I, we will put it up again, and, and I will invite you to read it along with me. But just listen to it, read it, and think about it now. It is our aim to glorify God by growing to be a local church that is defined by biblical doctrine, is gospel-driven, exemplifies unconditional love, is theologically and practically oriented to God's grace, and is anticipating the final hope of Christ's return. I'm going to read it one more time for you. It is our aim to glorify God by growing to be a local church that is defined by biblical doctrine, is gospel-driven, exemplifies unconditional love, is theologically and practically oriented to God's grace, and is anticipating the final hope of Christ's return. So, what does that mean? Well, that's what we're going to spend the next five or so weeks uh, looking over. Um, both Matt and Sam have prepared lessons on these. So this week we're going to look at that first uh, portion of it, about it being our aim to glorify God by growing to be a local church. That is our, uh, that's our uh, beginning premise. We're laying groundwork today. And then uh, we're going to get a lesson. Actually, we're going to change the order because the gospel has such importance and primacy that we'll go to that next week. But we're going to talk about what it means to be defined by Bible doctrine. What does it mean that we look seriously and literally at the Word of God and let the Word of God tell us how we will, what we will believe, what we will think, how we will choose to live? What does it mean to be defined by what you believe specifically from the Word of God? What does it mean for us to be gospel-driven? What does it mean for us to be driven by our mission to make disciples of all nations? What does it mean for us to live with the gospel on the tip of our tongue? If you are not familiar with us as a church body, you know that it comes up regularly. We'll go through John 3.16. We'll go through the, the gospel you know, through the slides according to Ron Shea. We'll, we'll present the gospel with regularity, and part of that is that you never outgrow your need to understand the gospel. But a huge part of that is, is that by that repetition, it is our prayer that we might become so familiar with the gospel that when the time comes and the Spirit uh, is at work drawing someone and we can share the right, the information, the clear gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, so what does it mean to be gospel-driven in terms of how we live and what we do? What does it mean to exemplify unconditional love? How, if, if Jesus Christ said, by this they shall know that you're my disciples, if you love one another, he set the supremacy of a love God's kind of love, agape love, caring love, an approval and a warmth between people. So how, what does it mean for us to be defined by that? Be honest, it's so easy for us to fall into the trap of the Ephesian church. Of course, it, the Ephesian church in the book of Ephesians is lauded, is praised for the, the mutual love and care which they have. But by the time you get to the end of the first century and Jesus is giving his message to the Ephesian church, he says, your love has grown cold. In a generation, they were doctrinally accurate, but they lacked love. And interestingly, Jesus said to the Ephesian church, I'm coming to take your lampstand if you don't return. That should shake us. That should shake us to our core. Because I would argue that my shortcoming and, and, and a challenge for us as a church is that we're prob probably a little bit better at being right than we are at being truly loving and self-sacrificial. It's theologically and practically oriented to God's grace. God's grace is the very air that we breathe. Uh, we are not under law, we're told, but under grace. That means we're in an entirely different system of living. And what it means to grow in Christ does not mean obeying or getting better at obeying laws, but it means being 
uh, transformed and living under, in, under the rule, if you like, of God's amazing grace poured out for us in Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about what does that mean? What does it mean for us to be practically and theologically oriented to God's grace? And finally, is anticipating the final hope of Christ's return. We've mentioned this repeatedly, but one of the great tragedies of the modern American church is that we've stopped talking about heaven. We've stopped talking about the return of Christ. We've stopped talking about our eternal, our blessed hope. And that has gutted the church from any meaningful association and orientation to history and what we're meant to be doing now. And so we're going to continue to be, uh, be active in our anticipation of the final hope of Christ's return. So with that as our sort of overview, we are going to spend a week on each of these elements, starting today with our aim to glorify God. Now, we often talk about the doxological view of uh, history, and all that means is that uh, doxo is the, the idea of praise, it's, and logico, log, logico is, is to serve Logikos, serve, speak, or serve, rather speak, to say, or it can have the idea of a thought, right? So biology is the study of bio. This is the idea of biological life. Doxology is that we think and interpret the world from a doxological or a glory standpoint. But glory for who? And clearly the answer is glory to God. God's glory is the center, according to the Bible, is the center of God's plan. And you say, well, what's the alternative? There's actually lots of alternatives. You can have a man-centered theology. You can have a salvation-centered theology. In fact, I, uh, much of my background, I thought in terms of this is a book about getting people saved and how they're going to be saved, how to get them saved, what every single passage. And I was sitting there wondering, what's with all these ridiculous passages about Christian growth? All that matters is how you get them saved. I can't say this isn't useful in, a, in an evangelism circumstance. Cut it out. Throw it out. My whole Bible could have been a pamphlet. But in the doxological view of our existence and of theology, we recognize that the most important feature is God's glory. And so as we look at the seven dispensations, we see that they are all marked by glorifying God. It's not just a salvation story. It is a story of God's glory. And yes, he's glorified in salvation, as we'll see. But in our first first dispensation, we see the Garden of Eden and innocence. God is glorified by creating this beautiful world, by creating man, Adam and Eve, in his own image, relational with him. He created everything to work well. He is glorified in that. He is glorified in giving them the choice to obey or disobey him. And he's glorified in his mercy in spite of humans' failure and his willingness to put forth a salvation a plan, or a redemption plan, I should probably say, because it's not just about spiritual salvation. He's redeeming the entirety of planet Earth. Again, why? For his glory. Two, conscience, Adam and Eve's family. Essentially, the world is governed by no external law. Man is not allowed to have authority over man or punish other pre- people. And so we just thought, maybe if everyone just did what was right in their own eyes and followed their conscience, everything would go well. And God is glorified because we see that our conscience is uh, petty and seared and ruined. And so when people lived according to their own conscience and that alone, the results were disastrous and man's thoughts were evil and violent all the time such that the Lord had to be glorified in a massive judgment of sin, wiping that that whole world off and leaving only Noah and his children. Um, In the era of human government in which we still exist. Human government, the Noahic covenant is still in effect. It was with your forefathers and your foremothers and ours. And so this is still uh, the Noahic covenant. You can read very, very personally. Um, God is allowing for and making it possible for humans to rule over other humans in righteous government for protection, for the punishment of wrongdoers, of evildoers for the protection of individuals. So this is a picture of God giving some of his authority and maybe, you know, also shows us, as we've seen, that while government as God's divine institution is a wonderful tool for, uh, for managing and keeping safe us and society and the nations, it is also flawed because we are flawed. And so we argue over capitalism or communism or parliamentary or democracy or whatever it is that we might think, and none of them work. Well, not perfectly. Why? Some work better than others. Well, because 
the people involved are still sinful. And so God is glorified. We see that even if with the, uh, the, the divinely ordained uh, structure of government, we still fail because sin is still within us. We still need um, God. And there's the judgment of the Tower of Babel that breaks us up. And that sounds like a horrible judgment. But what it does, it breaks up. He scatters people throughout the earth and he changes our language. And that protects us from being able to be tyrannical, or at least it did. Protected us until, from being tyrannical over each other. You couldn't get everyone together because not everyone was speaking the same language. And that separation was a gigantic protection on humanity. Then we get into God's plan uh, for Israel, and God chooses and makes a promise to Abraham. It is an entirely grace-based promise. He does not expect anything from Abraham except for his faith and his faith alone. So God gives Abraham a promise, and that promise is yet to be fulfilled. We see it continually, his promise of land, seed, and blessing uh, being fulfilled throughout the ages, and finally uh, looks toward the final uh, earthly dispensation of the millennial kingdom to reach its zenith and its completion. The law of Moses was a dispensation and, and answers the question. The, the purpose of the law of Moses, of course, was to protect the seed line, to keep Israel a special people, a unique nation separated under God so that when Jesus Christ stepped onto the scene, we could notice, we could see him, we could figure it out. But the law of Moses also shows us as a sort of secondary application that even if God told us exactly what to do all the time, we'd still blow it. And so while the law succeeded absolutely in protecting Israel and preparing them and uh, preparing them for the Messiah, it also showed that even if God told you exactly what to do every day when you get up and when you go to work and when you come back and when to do this and when to do that, we would still blow it. We still need him and his perfect provision. Then we see in the church, this is our age now, after the resurrection of Christ, the rejection and the temporary abeyance of God's plan for Israel, we see that we now live in this age of grace wherein any person can come to God and be a part of the body of Christ by grace through faith. And God is glorified by this time of his grace being open and available. He's gracious in all times. That's why I like to call this the church age, not the age of grace, as it's often called. But we are, anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ and in his death for them, and the gospel right now becomes a part of the church. That's, a, that's what God's doing now. No one needs to get baptized, fill out a form, fill out a card. Nobody needs to take First Communion or, or uh, you know, go do 15 good works. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All you need to do is accept, receive that gift of eternal life offered in Jesus Christ. God is glorified by his grace, by his perfect salvation, by his forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And God is glorified in the fact that, that still many, if not the majority of humans, reject that perfect gift. So if any human ever said, well, if you could have just made it easier, if you could have just done more, then, we would be, then more would be saved. I couldn't have made the door any wider. I couldn't have made it any more open. So the Lord is glorified in his grace and his mercy and justified in his judgment. So when we get to the tribulation or the transition into the kingdom that goes through the the Antichrist and the judgments of, of bowls and seals and trumpets and all, all, all of that business, we see that God is entirely justified and glorified in his judgment of evil on the earth. And finally, the Lord will be glorified in the kingdom reign of Christ. He'll be glorified in, in, in answering that question, what if, what if death was no more or largely taken away? What if the scarring of sin's impact on this world were largely removed and animals and ecology and, and starvation were no more? What if we finally had a righteous and just government that we could count on for all wisdom and peace for all time? And so we see that one, God is glorified in his ability to do that in spite of our sin because of the blood and the work of Jesus Christ. And we also see that God is glorified in that even under those conditions, some choose to rebel against God and lead a rebellion against Christ and his kingdom. God is glorified in every step of human history. Not one moment, not one moment of this does not bring glory to God. It's not all about us in the church. That's, we're not the centerpiece of everything. Jesus Christ, God and his glory is the centerpiece of everything. So, God is glorified in the world, according to Scripture, in uh, Psalm 148, 1 through 5. Will you please read with me? 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. God is glorified. He designed everything from the angels to the stars, from the earth and all that is around, surrounding it. Everything is designed and meant to bring God glory. As the master artist, he is glorified by his creation at every level. That is the design. That is the purpose of everything. He's glorified in Israel. And we could look at many passages, of course, to talk about this, the entire Old Testament, for example. But Romans 9, Romans 10, and Romans 11 give us a beautiful picture of how God was, is glorified by selecting a family to be his earthly people, the family of Abraham. Well, not all the children of Abraham, but Isaac, of Jacob, Right? And of the 12 sons and his faithfulness to them in spite of their failure and faithfulness, faithlessness, which any human group would have and any human would uh, all, represents us all, we might say in that regard. But Israel's past represents God's faithfulness, God's plan, God's power, and God's love. Romans 10 talks about Israel's present. And while much of, if not most of Israel, most of Israel surely, is in rejection of her Messiah, God is still glorified in wanting every single person, Jewish or Gentile, to come to salvation by grace through Jesus Christ to become a part of the church. And even though a Jewish person puts faith in Christ, they become a part of that faithful remnant that always exists in Israel. And finally, Romans 11 shows Israel's future is that God, through the tribulation period, will call Israel back to himself and Israel believing will be saved and be a part of setting up the millennial kingdom with Christ reigning on David's throne. So Israel in itself as God's chosen earthly people glorifies God. That's the point of God's plan for them. It's interesting that the church often looks jealously over at Israel's uh, promises and blessings and, um, and, and hope and wishes that we could have that. We have our own blessings and hope, and we glorify God in our own way. But this is how God glorifies him, is glorified through Israel. God is glorified through us in the church. We won't read the whole passage of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, although I always think it's good. I just want to put in these highlighted statements. He's talking about our salvation, our position in Christ, and he says all of this, all is God has done for you as the believer is all to the praise of the glory of his grace in verse 6. Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together all one, uh, all in, in one all things in Christ. In other words, that everything is leading towards glorifying and being gathered together and gathered around Christ. It's all, verse 12, to the praise of his glory. And uh, verse 14, to the praise of his glory again. Again, the point is, is that as you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you exist to the praise of his glory. As you have trusted in Jesus Christ, as you're saved by grace through faith, through his mighty power, through his working, through his hand, you exist to the glory of God. And everything thereafter, that is the defining principle of what's meant to, um, meant to guide and direct your individual life as well as our church life. So you can answer almost any, if you want to know what God's will in any situation, you can almost always get really good insight by saying, what of these choices will most glorify God. Sometimes it's not easy or clear, often, but it's a great principle to start with. What glorifies God maximally and how so? Finally, we look at Revelation 21. This is the new heavens and the new earth. And we find that this is the description. It says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun, or of the moon to shine on it, in it, for God, the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is, it, is its light. We could, move, we could uh, read on, but I think you get the point. Eternity future, the new heavens and the new earth, will be about God's glory. And again, you want to live the happiest, best life you can possibly live? 
Live for God's glory. That's how we're designed to live. I'm not saying that everything will go right with you or for you while you're on this earth. Quite to the contrary, you'll face tri- tribulation and trial. But if you understand that the purpose of your existence is to glorify God in every situation, you'll recognize that nothing can ruin your life. Nothing can ruin your day because nothing can get in the way of your uh, God-given ability, calling, and purpose to glorify God day in, day out with each breath. You do so as a person who's trusted Christ, as being saved, as being born again. You already glorify him just by being. And every time you live out his life and you spend a moment trusting him, he's glorified anew and afresh and more fully in your life. So as we think about glorifying God in the church, we glorify God by growing. Not growing nickels and noses, not getting more people in here, not uh, showing off more success in terms of online views or in-person building projects or whatever else it is. We glorify God by growing individually and corporately. When you grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, you show the power of God to a world that knows nothing of his life and his love. By your individual growth, You glorify God. When you come and learn the Bible, when you let the truth of the word of God replace the lies of this world and correct the misconceptions that we've come up with according to our own thinking and our own logic, our own uh, sinful natures, every time you do that, God is glorified increasingly in your life and your capacity to glorify him grows. But even more so, we glorify God by growing corporately. Again, not in numbers, but by growing in our mutual connection around the person and work of Jesus Christ, in our mutual ministry and our collective service of God and his word in this world. Think about that. We glorify God by acting like the church that, we're meant to, that we were saved to be. We glorify God by sharing the gospel in whatever way we can make it known. You can drop it casually into conversations. You can share the gospel through uh, on your Facebook page or your MeWe page or whatever else it is that you do social, in your social electronic fake life. You can share the gospel in your real life by doing something as quiet and simple as leaving a tract in a public restroom. As weird as, as, weird as, it is, as weird as it is to think, someone will pick it up, <laughs> even if it's just the worker. You have an opportunity to share the gospel in various ways, in various times, and that glorifies God, regardless of what the responses may be at that moment. You uh, glorify God, we glorify God by declaring his glory. Have you ever... Or maybe, maybe it just sounds too weird, but is, that, if, is anyone ever asked you, how you doing? You say, God is good. I feel okay. You're just glorifying God for the fact that he, glorifying God, publicly declaring his glory before others. When we get together and we read God's word and we proclaim God's word, we're declaring God's glory. That's the purpose. I hope that's part of the reason why you come here, is you come here just to have someone remind you how great and how glorious and how wonderful your God is. We do this together in praise and worship as we read and declare. We sing these wonderful hymns and spiritual songs that declare his goodness. I hope you praise him in your heart in each day as each day passes. I hope you have worship moments in your house or in your, in your home, in your quiet time, where you can just sit and sing your favorite hymns or listen to your favorite Christian music of whatever era that glorifies God in your heart and your life. When we're talking about growth, as we said, we're, the, the important thing is spiritual growth. This is our mission for this year. You want it, this is it. Your mission for this year is to grow spiritually. If you're gonna make a, a New Year's resolution let it be to grow spiritually. See, I was already growing spiritually. That's right. Praise God. Keep that goal. <laughs> Keep doing it. Your, your growth in the grace and knowledge of Christ, whether it's uh, it, through your private reading, through your reading through a, the Bible in a year, whatever reading plan you have, through these uh, Our Daily Bread devotionals, through your commitment to being in church and, and showing up and hearing the word of God and being connected to your brothers and sisters in Christ, Spiritual growth is our goal. When we say we want to grow to be a local church, we point out that it is not a destination, it's a process. 
We'll never be a perfect church. We always need to be growing to be a church that is made up of individuals who are more and more like Christ. The local church grows by every believer individually growing. I've given you these passages, uh, though we won't look at them now. However, uh, 2 Peter 3.18, obviously the command that we looked at in previous weeks to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 2.2 uh, explains that command by saying that we should desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Right? So you're going to grow in Christ by growing in your consumption of his word. Remember he said as newborn babes. He didn't say you are newborn babes. He says like a baby cries and cries and screams to be fed. So you ought to cry and scream to be spiritually fed whenever you can. Every single day long for that like a shrieking infant that's not caring one bit for his sleep-deprived, nearly maddened mother, but just needs, wants the nourishment of that pure milk. Let that be the attitude of your life and your desire to know Christ, to grow in his word. Romans 6, 11, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed under sin and alive to God in Christ. Count on those spiritual facts. Believe that what God did and what Christ, God did for you in Christ and in that salvation is pure and permanent. And Romans 12, 1 and 2, we're focusing on the presentation. Present yourself to him. Present your life to him in response. This was our, our reading, and it, it, it was actually the first passage that I, uh, well, it's not the first passage I taught on here, but as, it, as we started off my very first year, 11 years ago here at FCBC, this was the passage we chose. Will you please read with me? And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. All right, so here we've got some to be apostles and prophets. These are, uh, these are gifts that, that gave us revelation, that gave us the word of God. Some evangelists, those who share the word of God and train us to share in the word of God well. And pastors and teachers, those who teach the word of God and exhort and shepherd, under shepherd, uh, the body of Christ. Why? So that you can be equipped to do the works of ministry in your life, as we studied in our class this morning. And then he gives us this picture of spiritual maturity. And this picture of spiritual maturity is very clearly not being thrown around and manipulated by either the doctrines of this world or the circumstances of this world. But with a fixed gaze on Jesus Christ, trusting in the working of the Holy Spirit will not be manipulated or, or brought in by false teachers. Rather, will be able to say with confidence, I know my God. I know my Savior, Jesus Christ. I know what he has done for me. I know what he is doing, and I know how he wants me to respond. I can point it out to you exactly where it is, for the Bible tells me so. That's the picture of maturity you're wondering what it would look like. It looks like a person who knows what God has said to us and is living that out. That's spiritual maturity in a point. A person who's living in accordance with God's perfect revelation. We're growing to be a local church. Now, this is important because there is a universal church and there is a local church. The universal church consists of, and this is the way that the language is used, although Paul never makes these definitions as such, or 
the New Testament authors, we see that there's a distinction between the church, generically or, or maybe universally, and this is not universalism. This is the fact that everyone who is trusted in Jesus Christ is brought into, spiritually, the body of Christ. So God sees lots of little churches, but he sees his body of every saved person, everyone who's ever trusted in Christ, dotted and spread throughout the world. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one, I should say one spirit. So this is the picture that we share one spirit. We are all a part of one body. Baptized here means identified. We are identified with one body that is the body of Christ as it spreads out throughout from Acts 2 all the way to the time of the rapture. As it spreads throughout the world, you're connected to everyone who's trusted in Jesus Christ and been born again. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You are an individual member of the larger universal body of Christ. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, and everything he might be preeminent. And finally, uh, Ephesians 1 gives us the apparatus. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, theologians and their, in a, in their incredible ability to make simple things confusing have mucked this up terribly. But the biblical order is incredibly clear. You heard the word of truth. You heard the gospel, and you believed it, and you were positioned in him. Anyone who claims to complicate this process one iota more is just a liar. They might not be trying to be, but it's just voluntary deception. Whatever their, whatever their reason is for it, it's so simple. You became a part of this body when you heard the word of God. And you believed in it. And having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And that means that we can get to and talk about the local church because the local church is different. The local church can be meeting together or not. We can have all sorts of problems. This is where Hebrews 10.25, talking about a local church, says don't neglect or not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, what was he saying? He's saying that there's these Hebrew Christians who had neglected to meet together. They were still a part of the universal body of Christ, but he's telling them, meet together locally with other believers in Jesus, right? And so uh, Revelation 2.1 and various others talks about uh, Jesus is sending a message to the angel of the church of Ephesus or the church of Pergamos or the church of Thyatira and so on and so forth. He's not saying that the church is localized there. He's saying that a, the local gathering of believers there is meant to uh, be meeting. So I've made this helpful diagram. You can be one of several people. You can first of all be a, an unbeliever. You are part of neither the universal nor the local church. And that's Tragic. This person needs to trust in Christ and get in a local church. That's what God's will for that person is, very simply. You might be in a local church but have not trusted Christ. I ter am terrified to think that there might be someone here today who sat through this entire boring sermon and not known the joy of what it means to be saved by grace through faith. And for you, I urge you, even though you're in a local church, it does nothing for your spiritual affair. It does nothing for your status before God. It does nothing to help you. It does nothing to bring you any closer. The only thing that will bring you into that is when you trust in Jesus Christ. Have you heard the gospel? You're sinful. You're fallen. We're, we're, we're goofed up. We don't need anyone to tell us that. We know that. And Jesus Christ... The Son of God put on flesh and came and died and paid the penalty for your sin and for my sin. And he offers it as a free gift which you received by, receive by trusting in him. When a person, whether they're outside of the local church or inside of the local church, makes no difference. The person in the local church might be a very good religious person. They might do lots of good things or they might not do some of the bad things. Whatever it is, there, none of those things will save. Only faith in Christ alone will save. Then a person becomes a part of the universal church. And this is another person. I tried to like vary their smiles, but it's not, a, it's not a really great illustration for what goes on. You can be a part of the universal church, but not connected to other believers. You're saved, sure, absolutely. But if you are not involved and invested in relationships with other believers, then you're missing out. You're falling short. 
of what God has provided for you. That salvation, as we saw in our doctrinal statement, is eternal and it's secure. Yes. But you were designed to grow and use your gifts in the context of a local church assembly, of a local church body. You think about it, even just the fruit of the Spirit, love. See, love requires an object. Love of God, love of others. And your church body is ground zero for how your faith gets played out. So a person can be a part of the universal church, they can be saved, but not a part of a local church. They're saved, they've got the Spirit of God, but they're missing out on God's plan and the growth that should be, could be happening. So here's the happiest person, and here I hope is you right now. You are involved in a local church, and most importantly, you are spiritually and eternally saved. You are a part of the universal church and a part of the local church. And I wanna remind you that the church never means a building. Ever once in scripture does it refer to a building. It is always a group of people, whether you're meeting in someone's living room or in a public park or an underground railway, railroad tunnel, it doesn't matter. It's about the body of Christ, people who have trusted in Christ, gathering together around his word, around his will, around his gospel, around his truth. So, hopefully that diagram's reasonably helpful in understanding what every person needs. First, to trust in Christ and become a part of the universal church by trusting in him and that alone. And then to become a part of a local church so that you get those moment by moment opportunities, that love, that interaction with others. So, as we come to a close in this opening or introductory study and where we're going to be headed, we'll look next week at what it means to be gospel-driven. Hopefully we've whetted your appetite. Hopefully you know well enough what the gospel is. But come, I hope, with anticipation and a desire to let your life increasingly reflect the nature, the love, and the grace of that gospel. You will be direct, uh, we will learn what it means to be directed by Bible doctrine, to exemplify God's addition, uh, unconditional love, to live according to God's grace, and finally to live in the hope of Christ's return. I promise you you'd have this opportunity, and um, if uh, you have a struggle with it for whatever reason, please feel free to remain silent or just move your mouth and not say it. But I want to invite you to start or start the process of getting on board with this little mission statement by reading this with me, if you feel comfortable. Here we go. It is our aim to glorify God by growing to be a local church that is defined by Bible doctrine, is gospel-driven, exemplifies unconditional love, is theologically and practically oriented to God's grace, and is anticipating the final hope of Christ's return. Let's close our study with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You've provided all that we need for life and godliness. In your Son, in your Word, in your Holy Spirit, in your gifts, in your church body, universal and local. Lord, how we praise you. We could do nothing less. Might we, O oh Lord, as we humbly submit to you, as we listen to your word, might we grow in the grace and knowledge of him that we might fulfill your desires for us and that you might be glorified in all things and in all ways and all times. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen.